Global Connect at SBF helps Singapore businesses expand into overseas markets. Since November 2019, we have guided Singapore businesses as they seize business opportunities in Asia and beyond. From identifying emerging trends to closing deals, we provide a full spectrum of overseas business expansion services. With Global Connect at SBF, you can learn about new markets, customers, and free trade agreements across the globe. Land opportunities and scale up in new markets, both physically and digitally. Localize overseas operations to ensure sustainable long-term success. Our Singapore enterprise centers in Indonesia and Vietnam also provide on-the-ground business and market development services. We also provide a dedicated digital B2B marketplace to quickly scale your business overseas. With Global Connect B2B, set up your company profile in minutes and start contacting thousands of regional partners and customers. Last year, Global Connect at SBF reached out to over 2,000 companies, completing many overseas expansion projects through its network of trusted business specialists and professionals. In 2021, Global Connect at SBF will also launch new initiatives for Singapore businesses to position themselves on the international stage. Explore business opportunities across ASEAN, South Asia, Japan, and other markets by joining us at Festival, our flagship digital event. Become part of the Global Connect at SBF community today and start enjoying exclusive benefits. Customized business advice, access to our overseas Singapore enterprise centers, preferential rates for services, as well as structured training, one-on-one -on -one advisory, and assistance on using free trade agreements to extract greater commercial advantages abroad. Global Connect at SBF, connecting your business to global opportunities. Dear His Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Thank you for attending the fourth edition of the China Economic Outlook webinar series organized by Singapore Business Federation. As we know, 2021 is shaping up to be a big year for China, with many parts of the economy now stabilized and the COVID-19 vaccine rollout underway. The Chinese government is cautiously optimistic about the direction and scope of the country's full re recovery. Moving into the second half of year 2021, 
it is expected that China will continue to rebalance its economy and push up long-term reforms. Against this backdrop, SBF has invited three speakers from Singapore, mainland China and Hong Kong to share their invaluable insights with us today on topics such as China's latest investment landscape, currency outlook, business opportunities in the Great Bay Area, etc. Our objective today is to help Singapore and regional businesses, both large enterprises and SMEs, to understand the Chinese economy and industry trends better, and to explore the new and underlying business opportunities beyond COVID-19. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions that you would like to raise, you may do so by using the Q&A function of this Zoom meeting at any time during the webinar. Our speakers may choose to reply to you during the Q&A session or answer to you separately. If you need help, you can also use the raise hand tool under the participants window and our colleagues will assist you from here. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Wu Huiming, today's first speaker to you. Ms. Wu is leading the CICC Global Institute, in short CGI, as the managing director. CGI is part of the listed company, China International Capital Corporation Limited, which is China's first joint venture investment bank and a pioneer of adopting the international practices in China. Ms. Wu is currently based in Beijing, China. Before her relocation last year, she has been with CICC Singapore for eight years during 2012 to 2020, mainly focused on micro, uh, macroeconomics, ASEAN regional economy, and Bell and Road related research. Now, please allow me to pass the mic to Ms. Wu for today's pre presentation on market outlook and updated investment landscape in China. Ms. Wu, please. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Flora. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for SBF to invite me to join this activity. Um, I don't know what's the problem about my virtual background setting. So uh, I think so far I can do the presentation um, using the normal background. Uh, you can hear me and see me clearly, right? Yes, we can, loud and clear, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether you know about CICC. Um, I'd like to use in one minute to give a very brief introduction about CICC. Um, China International Capital Corporation is a first joint venture investment bank in China. Our business includes investment banking, equities, FICC, investment management, and wealth management services. Of course, all of these businesses are based on our comprehensive research coverage. Our headquarters in Beijing, and we have a number of subsidiaries and more than 200 branches around mainland China. Uh, in the meantime, we actively expand our business in the overseas market. So far, we have our overseas office. We have in Hong Kong, Singapore, New York, London, San Francisco, Frankfurt, and Tokyo. I'm from the research department. We have more than 300 analysts covering micro uh, strategy, commodity, and industries. So thanks SPF again for this opportunity to share with all of you how is everything going on in China and where is the investment opportunities. So let's begin the topic. Next page, please. Yeah, China economy, uh, I think we can talk about um, uh, in these two parts. One is the economic outlook, and the other one is a very hot topic in China. It's about carbon neutrality opportunities in China. Uh, next page. Uh, China's economy recovery may continue in the second quarter in 2021. Um, in the first quarter, uh, next page, please. Uh, in the first quarter, the GDP grew at 18.3% year over year due to the very low base last year. But Frankly speaking, this number is still lower than our expectation, which is more than 19%. Why for that? Um, what part of the economy recovery is lower than expectation? I think I will talk about that in the next few slides. After the first quarter, 
we revised down our forecast from 9% to 8.5% for the whole 2021, implying the CAGR from 2019 to 2021 as around 5.4%. So it's slightly still quite high compared to the other economies. And from the quarterly side, our forecast for the second quarter is 7.6%. For third quarter, the GDP growth will be about 5.8%. And fourth quarter should be around 5%. So we means that the China economy recovery may continue in 2021 for the whole year, but growth rate will slow down. Um, um, next page, we talk about the COVID-19 situation in China, but as you, I think all of you may know that currently the COVID-19 uh, situation in China so far, so uh, our control, control is so far so good. And the vaccine, nation as well in line or even faster from you know city level compared to some rural areas so currently i think the uh, manufacturing the consumption are uh, all back on the recovery path but what we talk about what's the part of the economy has not you know as lower than expectation i think mainly come from the consumption side that's what what we talk about that the, especially for the service consumption, has yet to return to 2019 levels. On this page, on page four, we listed some, you know, subsidiaries of different kinds of the consumption, like the movie box office, the railway passenger, the flight passenger, the highway passenger. So you can see that compared to the level of 2019, for example, the railway, the flight, the highway is still quite lower compared to the 2019 level. But from the catering revenue, from the average hotel occupancy, it's roughly uh, the equal to the level of 2019. But the good news is if we look at the number of the just May Day holiday, the railway passenger, the latest number in the first three days, climb to about 15.8 million people, implying around 4% growth compared to 2019. It's a very good sign, but we cannot be very optimistic so far because first, if you look at the growth momentum, it's still quite lower compared to 2019 because we remember in 2019 May holiday, the railway passenger, the growth rate is more than 10%. But now, you know, it's just around five to four percent. And another reason is that we all see that the situation, in, the COVID nineteen situation in India seems not that good. And we already found some, you know, the India related cases in mainland China now. So we don't know whether, you know, in the second quarter or the third quarter we will have uh, more tightening actions about this COVID nineteen period. So it will may, may bring negative impact on the service consumption again. So that's why uh, we think the first quarter, even the second quarter, the recovery in China is not that as good as our expectation. On, on page six, we talk about the FAI recovery from the investment side. Um, I think you know from the investment, we have the infrastructure FAI, we have the manufacturing, we have the real estate. Um, for this side, the infrastructure is supported by the government. So uh, the government side, the support is very strong. So the infrastructure side is quite good. And uh, another one is the manufacturing. Due to the COVID-19, the global supply chain has a big shock. But China manufacturing, you know, we gained some market share in the global uh, in the global supply chain. So, so far we can see that export business related and the manufacturing FAI um, is already, you know, yeah, it's next page. Yeah. So um, we can see that on this page, the infrastructure FAI is so far so good supported by the government and the manufacturing FAI due to the global supply chain shock and China gained a little bit market share. So the manufacturing uh, FAI outperformed. And another one is the real estate FAI. 
because real estate FAI in the last year and in the first quarter of 2021, the real estate market is very strong. So the investment is also quite good. But uh, on next page, we will see that there should be tightening, especially for the low uh, tightening uh, of the property developers due to the very strong growth of the property price in the second half of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021. So looking forward from the investment side, our forecast is the infrastructure will be quite good and the manufacturing FEI is you know, maintain the growth momentum, but real estate investments will slow down due to the low financing tighten. On the next page, on page eight, we talk about export growth supported by accelerate global recovery. That's what I talk about, that due to the COVID-19 uh, 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 situation on the demand side, uh, 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 together with the global recovery, the demand is very strong. And due to, you know, other some emerging markets, the manufacturing recovery is quite lower. So during this period, China export growth is so far so good and we gain a little bit market share under this period. And on page nine, the next page, we talk about from the profit, profit side for the manufacturing company is not that good because on the first hand, we can see that the raw material price up is more than the producer price. That means from the, for the manufacturing company, uh, the raw material, the cost uh, climb so fast and the revenue is relatively lower. So from the profit side, even for the manufacturing company, uh, the profit is not good compared to you know, 2019 or even earlier period. That is not a good sign. And the next page we talk about the last one about the micro economy is the divergence between the range and the poor, the rich and the poor, and the real economy and the finance. On the left part, you can see two price index. One is a luxury consumer price index, which is quite, you know, quite, quite high. And the other one is the normal CPI non-food is already, you know, lower than the luxury consumption price index. And the, on the right hand side on this page, it's a very, very interesting topic. What happened in China is the housing price and the housing rent. On the right hand side as the housing price, you can see um, the, the, the surge even after 2019, 2020 and 2021, uh, even in the tier one cities and tier two cities, the housing price have been up more than 20% uh, in the typical uh, cities. But from the rent, housing rent side, due to the COVID-19 period, especially on the 2020, you can see the red line, the housing rent even down a little bit. So that's the divergence from the real economy and the finance part. That's why we think the central government have to tightening the low financing. That means the real estate market in the next few quarters will cooling down. That's our story about the microeconomy. So next page, we will, uh, next page is the last part is about the social financing, the total social financing so far. That means the total social financing um, due to the COVID-19 period, the government provide a lot of liquidity of the financing to the enterprises. So you can see the total fi social financing growth as um, a little bit strong compared to, you know, uh, the, the 2019 period. And that's maybe some reason for the divergence from the real economy and the financing part. And next story, we talk about the carbon neutrality. I think it's the most uh, hot topic in China in, in both the secondary market, the primary market. We talk about, you know, due to the uh, last September, uh, China government uh, to give to sending the signal that Ch China for the carbon emission will get to peak level um, in 2030 and will come to the carbon neutrality in 2016. What does that mean? On next page, you can see on page 13, for European countries, 
when they get the peak level for the carbon emission as 1979. But the carbon neutrality, the year target is 2050. That means for European companies, they have 70 years from the peak level to the carbon neutrality. For US, they, are, they also achieved the carbon peak, the carbon emission peak in 2005. They will achieve the carbon neutrality by 2015, the similar as European countries. But from the peak level to the carbon neutrality will about 45 years. But how about China? You know, currently, as we are still the uh, developing countries, our carbon emission is still on the growth path. So we will come to the peak level by 2030, but we have to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2060. We only have 30 years. That means from the peak level to the carbon neutrality, China will have the biggest challenge compared to European and US countries. It's a great challenge for China. And next page, we talk about to achieve the peak level and then to achieve the carbon neutrality. The one of the most supporting factor is the investment. We have to do a lot of, you know, to renovate the older technologies and equipment. We have to using a lot of innovative facilities. We have to, you know, to expand the existing low carbon technologies. All of this, we need a lot of financing. And according to CICC estimate, we expect the future for next 40 years for China green investment demand will achieve about 140 trillion RMB. That means for the first 10 years from the current level to the peak level, the annual investment for the green finance should be 2.2 trillion. And for the next three decades, from 2030 to 2060, the annual investment will be about 3.9 trillion RMB. It's a huge investment. And for China, if we want to achieve that peak target or the new carbon neutrality target, we have to invest this amount. So it will imply a lot of you know, investment opportunities on this part. And the next page, we talk about that uh, all in all, for China, the carbon neutrality, we have a big challenge. Now China is the largest global carbon emitter uh, in the world. So we first we come to the peak level and then we from the peak to the carbon neutrality as a big challenge. But for China, we still have a lot of opportunities because from the traditional energy to the, uh, the non-fossil fuel energy, it's now the resources related technology. It's the manufacturing, for example, the solar equipment, the solar industry is a manufacturing industry. So China has strengths in manufacturing and China also has strengths in the digital economy. So this should be give us a lot of potential uh, opportunities in the clean energy side. And we leave some key questions for uh, China when we come to you know, the uh, carbon neutrality um, uh, uh, carbon neutrality target, for example, how to implement this goal and how to, you know, we're using the multilateral framework to negotiate with the other parties to uh, complete the global climate policy, policy or the global, you know, the climbing uh, target again. And also including, especially for the Belt and Road countries, we should work on together on the climate issues. That, that there should be some challenges and opportunities for China. Uh, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wu, for the insightful sharing. Uh, indeed, green financing, sustainability, uh, carbon neutrality, etc. means a lot to the mankind and the business communities nowadays. Really appreciate your sharing just now. 
Thank you. A gentle, a gentle reminder to the participants as well. If you have any questions regarding uh, Ms. Wu's presentation or uh, anything related to the, the topic, uh, you can raise it at the uh, Q&A panel. Now, next, please allow me to invite uh, Mr. Edward Kanan to join us. As the corporate hedging manager from Western Union Business Solutions, Edward has more than uh, 20 years experience working in the financial markets across Australia, London, and now Singapore. Having previously worked as a foreign exchange and interest rates trader at ANZ Bank, he has a thorough understanding of FX markets. Today, he's going to share his insight with us on the latest currency movements and the trend observations on Chinese RMB as well as the risk management strategies to help protect your business from unfavorable currency movements. Over to you, Edward. Thank you. Thank you, Flora. So I'll just wait. I'll just share my screen now. One moment. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, it's a real privilege to be invited to present here today by SBF. So the purpose of the next 15 minutes or so is to firstly go through a brief market and currency outlook from a macro perspective. I'll then be addressing uh, some risk management strategies, including a short case study uh, for hedging uh, remember exposure, and then I'll be going through a summary of how it all ties together. So I'll be starting with the market and currency uh, update. So in terms of what's driving currency markets at the moment, firstly, we've seen unprecedented stimulus measures rolled out globally, in particular in the US, where we've recently seen the Biden administration uh, sign off that $2 trillion uh, stimulus package. This has resulted in buoyant equity markets, which seemingly are reaching record highs month in, month out, and that directly impacts currency markets. The COVID vaccine rollout globally is well underway, but it's interesting to see how quickly some countries are rolling out the vaccines compared to others. And of course, directly related to uh, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, uh, the economic recovery that is well underway in China is also worth comparing to how this is going on in other parts of the world. So in terms of how equities have been supported by those stimulus measures that have been rolled out, on the chart here, we have the S&P 500 index, the broadest uh, US index uh, in the blue shaded area. Uh, and we can see that over the past 12 months to the end of April this year, the S&P 500 rose a staggering 49%. It's just in 12 months. Uh, so when you consider that on average, going back 50 years, the average return for the S&P 500 is in the vicinity of 8 to 9%. To have a return of almost 50% in one year uh, is quite unbelievable. The NASDAQ has outperformed even that level, rising 63% across the same period. The reason for the technology heavy NASDAQ rising even more is that, of course, we're now all much more dependent uh, on technology than we were prior to the pandemic. Now, in terms of the impact on currency markets, the two currencies that have been impacted the most by this uh, trend in equities has been the US dollar and the Japanese yen. So those two currencies are known as safe haven currencies. In times of economic uncertainty and when stock markets are selling off like they were in March of last year, that's when there's a flight to safety in those two currencies. However, when stock markets are doing well, like they are at the moment, there's no uh, demand for those two safe haven currencies. And so both the US dollar and the Japanese yen have underperformed over the past six to nine months. In terms of the uh, COVID vaccine rollout, this chart here illustrates the differences between each country in terms of the speed of rollout. So the darker the shade of green, the faster the rollout. So what's firstly interesting to note is that countries that have maintained the vaccine quite well, uh, such as China, most of uh, Asia, Australia and New Zealand, although they've done very well in terms of containing the pandemic over the past 12 months, they haven't been the fastest in terms of the vaccine rollout. Most surprisingly, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom and to a lesser extent Europe, three uh, regions that had a great deal of difficulty containing the vaccine, 
they've actually been particularly fast with the rollout. And that's fed directly into currency markets. So the speed of the vaccine rollout in the US has supported the US dollar somewhat over the past couple of months. And in the UK in particular, there's a lot more optimism about the UK economy, which has fed into a stronger pound against just about all currencies over the past few months. So if we turn the focus to China, uh, and uh, the impact uh, on the renminbi itself. Uh, as we saw in Ms. Wu's presentation earlier, China's growth has rebounded uh, strongly uh, since the contraction at the start of last year. So in terms of their GDP, that's recovered since uh, the pandemic hit uh, in the first quarter of last year. Their most recent reading, 18.3%, was a bit of an outlier, given that's comparing to the contraction period. Uh, and as Ms. Wu pointed out, it was actually slightly lower than expected. However, what's apparent from the chart here is that it looks as though China's growth is pretty much back on track to those pre-pandemic levels above 6% per annum, which uh, well exceeds other developed economies such as the US, Europe, Australia, and other parts of the world. Now, in terms of currency markets, currency movements are always dependent on what's happening in the respective countries. And so it's always interesting to compare uh, the world's two largest economies. And in this chart here, we have the contribution to global GDP by the US, denoted by the blue line, and China by the yellow line. And what's firstly notable is that the gap has been closing over the past couple of decades, but more recently, uh, after the pandemic, we can see that the contribution to global growth by the US actually declined last year, whereas the contribution by China kept increasing. So the gap is very much closing, uh, and there's many uh, market analysts out there now who are saying that possibly within the next decade, China will become uh, the world's largest economy. Now, in terms of the impact on China versus the US of the pandemic, it's interesting to look uh, into a bit more detail in the macroeconomic data. And on this chart here, we have the unemployment rate of each country, the US in the blue line uh, and China denoted by the yellow line. So we can see with the US before the pandemic, global, uh, their unemployment was historically uh, very low, uh, tracking below 4%, in fact. China's unemployment rate uh, was slightly higher, uh, tracking above 5%. But then when the pandemic hit, the US unemployment rate uh, spiked dramatically up to almost 15%. Now it's since normalized back to levels of around 6.5%. But comparing to China, the Chinese unemployment rate did spike up above 6% but never uh, any higher. And has since actually normalized back to levels where it was po uh, before the pandemic. And so what we can see on the right-hand side of the chart here is that tables have been turned uh, in that the Chinese unemployment rate is now more than a full percentage point lower than the US unemployment rate. So it shows how much more adverse the impact has been on the US economy compared to China. If we look at retail sales, it paints a similar picture. So before the pandemic, US retail sales on a year on year basis were tracking along quite nicely, uh, just above 4%. Chinese retail sales at the start of 2020 were flat. There wasn't any year on year growth. When the pandemic broke out, uh, obviously both countries experienced negative readings of retail sales that gradually improved thereafter. But if we look at the past couple of readings, what we can see now is that Chinese retail sales as at the end of last year had actually overtaken uh, US retail sales. So just like the unemployment in the previous slide, this again shows uh, just how much more resilient the Chinese economy has been through the pandemic than the US economy. And this is fed directly into currency markets where we have seen a sharp decline in the US dollar uh, against the renminbi over the past six to nine months. I'll now move on to the risk management part of the presentation. So in terms of hedging uh, or risk management, I'd firstly just like to address uh, the chart here, which is the Singapore dollar against the renminbi. Now for, uh, to keep things straightforward, I'll refer to the renminbi going forward in this part of the presentation as the CNH, which is the offshore version of the renminbi, given that this is the deliverable version uh, of the currency and it's therefore uh, a lot easier to hedge in terms of more available solutions. So what we can see currently is that the Sing CNH pair is now close uh, to 12 month lows, tracking just below a level of 
So sellers of CNH may be relieved to lock in at current rates. If they need to sell CNH to buy Singapore dollars, then the rate has moved considerably into their favour compared to the highs seen over the past 12 months. Buyers of CNH uh, won't be as pleased about the move over the past 12 months. Uh, CNH has become a lot more expensive, but buyers of CNH also need to be aware that if we look back uh, to 2015, uh, things could get a lot worse. So in terms of currency markets, just because things have come down a long way or come up a long way, it doesn't mean that they can't keep going. So before I move into the case study, I'd just like to outline the mechanisms of the most commonly used and straightforward hedging strategy that of forwards and explain why, uh, particularly for currency pairs involving uh, the Chinese Yuan, why uh, the forward rate, the rate in the future is not the same as the current spot rate. So let's assume that the Sing CNH spot rate is at 4.9. So that means that 100,000 Singapore dollars will get you 490,000 CNH. The one year interest rate in both countries, in Singapore, you might get 0.25% if you're lucky to invest 100,000 for a year. The CNH one year rate is much higher. Let's assume 2.25%. So after one year, this 100,000 Singapore dollars will have grown to 100,250, probably not enough to live off. Uh, the 490,000 CNH will have grown to 501,025. So the implied FX rate after one year is just the CNH amount in one year's time divided by the Singapore dollar amount in one year's time, which gives a higher rate of 4.9978, or in forward points terms, we call that 978 forward points. Now, it's important to note that forward points do not imply a market direction for currency pairs. Just because the forward rate uh, that you'll be shown is higher, whether you're buying or selling Singapore dollars, it doesn't mean the market's ever actually going to go there. So with that said, if forward points are in your favour, in this case, if you're a buyer of CNH, seller of Singapore dollars to buy CNH, then you can utilise forward points to achieve a better rate than current market in the future. So this is particularly favourable for CNH buyers due to the currently higher interest rates in China compared to Singapore. However, it should also be noted that this isn't always the case. In every country, interest rates are subject to change and forward points may not always be in your favour. So before I step into the case study, I'd just like to outline the two products that will be referenced within the case study. The first forward contracts that we just went through. So in this example here, we have a customer who needs to buy 1 million CNH in six months time, selling Singapore dollars to buy CNH. And the forward rate in this table is 4.92. So in six months time, this customer will sell their Singapore dollars to buy a million CNH at that rate. The benefit of the forward contract, of course, you know the rate that you're going to get and there's full protection should rates move against you. The drawback of forwards is if rates move in your favour, there's no scope to participate in favourable rate movements. You're locked in at the forward rate. Now, one structure that provides protection like a forward does, but also allows for participation in favourable rate moves is a collar structure. So what this table here illustrates is a collar whereby a customer again needs to buy a million CNH in six months time selling Singapore dollars. And what the collar provides in this example is a protection rate at 4.88, slightly lower than the forward rate, but participation up to a level of five, which is well above the forward rate. So how this structure works in six months time, if the market rate, the spot rate is below 4.88, if it's at 4.8, for example, then this customer is fully protected to sell their Singapore dollars at 4.88. That's their worst case rate. If spots move slightly higher than current market, so if spots at 4.95, for example, then this customer isn't obligated to sell at 4.88. They won't do anything with the collar and they'll just sell in the market at 4.95. So they've been able to enjoy the participation of that favourable rate move. Now that participation is capped at the participation rate. So if the market's moved higher than that rate, up to 5.1, for example, then the customer must sell Singapore dollars at the rate of five to buy their million CNH. But of course, compared to the forward rate, 4.92, being able to participate up to a level of five is a much more favourable outcome in that case. 
So the benefits of the collar, it provides a worst case rate at the protection rate and also the ability to participate in favourable rate movements. The risk of the collar is that participation is limited to the participation rate. So if spot market does move higher than that rate, you may be obligated to sell or buy at a worse, case, uh, worse rate than the market at the time. So I'd like to just go through a case study now whereby uh, we worked with a customer last year who had exposure. They needed to buy uh, CNH for, uh, they were an importer. So their supplies uh, were imported from China and they needed to buy uh, CNH several months out using Singapore dollars. So at the time when we were speaking to this customer, which was in April of last year, they needed to buy 1 million CNH in six months time for their project supplies. They had a target rate of five, so they wanted to be selling their Singapore dollars at no worse than a level of five to buy their CNH. Spot market at the time in April of last year was 4.96. So the client was interested in a structure that could provide participation, but only if the target rate could still be protected. So we uh, considered two solutions with the customer. The forward rate could protect at a level of 5.02. So that was going to meet his requirements of being able to sell Singapore dollars above his target rate. The collar could protect only at 4.98. So that wasn't going to achieve his goal of protecting his target rate. Although the collar could provide participation up to a level of 5.06, the protection wasn't good enough. So the client in this instance entered a forward contract for six months to sell Singapore dollars and buy his million CNH in October, 2020. Now we spoke to the same client a few months later. He'd won another project uh, and he needed to hedge an amount of one and a half million uh, CNH, which he needed to buy in February of this year. So spot market at the time when we spoke to him again was 5.06. He still had the same target rate at the level of five to sell his Singapore dollars. And again, he was interested in participation if his target rate could be protected. So we again considered two solutions for a seven month hedge. So the forward rate could protect at a level of 5.11, well above his target rate. The collar could protect at a slightly lower level, 5.08 but that was also above his target rate. So this time around, the collar was a feasible solution. The collar also allowed for participation all the way up to 5.17, should rates continue to move in his favor. So for that reason, the client entered the collar contract for seven months to buy one and a half million CNH in February of this year. So just to summarize uh, and recap, both uh, the market uh, outlook and the risk management section. We can see that the stimulus that's been rolled out globally is working in keeping optimism in equity markets. And this is weighing on the safe haven currencies, in particular the US dollar and the Japanese yen. Markets thus far are pricing in a smooth vaccine rollout, but risks do remain if there are any issues with side effects and effectiveness uh, against new strains of COVID. We're seeing that China is catching up to the US in terms of contribution to global GDP, closing the gap on the world's largest economy. And this is definitely being supportive uh, to the renminbi as a whole. Uh, the Chinese economy hasn't been as impacted as adversely as the US economy by the pandemic. We saw that in the unemployment data and the retail sales data from both countries. And this is definitely fed through to currency markets. We've seen how much the renminbi is strengthened against the US dollar, but also against a lot of other currencies as well. Uh, and lastly, there's been many, there's many appropriate solutions uh, available for hedging CNH exposure if you do have CNH uh, risk within your business. So in terms of our final thoughts, <clears throat> run all possible scenarios if you have foreign exchange risk within your business. We saw in the charts earlier just how much these currency pairs can move in only a 12 month period, let alone in a five year period. Utilize forward points if they are in your favor. We saw that in current circumstances, if you're a buyer of CNH, you can actually achieve a better rate in the future just by locking in a forward contract. And lastly, have a plan in place and stick with it uh, to mitigate any foreign exchange risk within your business. 
That concludes my part of the presentation today. So thank you very much for listening and I'll now hand back to Flora. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for your sharing of the practical tools on managing our FX disclosures. Um, moving next, please allow me to introduce to you all uh, Mr. Nicholas Kwan from Hong Kong. Mr. Kwan is currently leading the research team under Hong Kong Trade and Development Council, providing research support on all macroeconomic and uh, business issues. Mr. Kwan and his team are frequently rated among the top research teams of Hong Kong, mainland China, Asia, and even the world in various polls for their excellent work in the research area. Today, Mr. Kwan will share with us what are the unique business opportunities for Singapore and the regional businesses to explore from the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. Mr. Kwan, please. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Flora, and thanks for SPF of <coughs> allowing me to share some thoughts with friends in Singapore and around the region. And also good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to friends around, uh, both inside and outside the region. Um, <clears throat> there's probably not much to new I can add about this topic. Uh, the Greater Bay Area has been talked about for some years now. Uh, in fact, when, uh, when the formal plan is being released about two years ago, uh, there's still a lot of expectation and query about it. But even now, there may still be some of those. First of all, uh, people who are not familiar with the China development may still have a worry about what is Greater Bay Area or GBA. In fact, there's another name for the same, uh, almost the same car area uh, we used to call them is Pearl River Delta, PRD. The two are more or less the same coverage, but some people say that the reason why they need to rename it or put in a new name is because they have something different uh, under the, new, uh, the different governments. My reading is that if you go into the development plan released two, two years ago uh, on the Greater Bay uh, area, you can find that actually there are quite interesting uh, areas which may, uh, may be different from the uh, previous PRD we understand. Um, for the position or the aim of this region, uh, the Chinese government, the central government has put in five key objectives to achieve. One is Half of them are basically domestic oriented and half are external oriented. Say for instance, they want to build this area into a region of a world-class city cluster. It's more or less local or domestic oriented. And it also say that in the last uh, uh, objective is to make it a quality living circle for poor people living and working and traveling there. But aside from that, all the others are actually one way or another related to external. Say, for instance, they want this uh, area to be an international innovation and technology hub for China. And then it also wanted to be a platform to, uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative. And lastly, either internal or external, depends how you look at it, it wanted to be an area which shows that how closely the Hong Kong and Macau special administrative regions can integrate with the rest of China. Um, next page, please. <clears throat> that is being stated officially, but many people at the beginning actually think in a different way. They, uh, they first compare this so-called Greater Bay Area with something with similar features uh, and sometimes with similar names like Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, Tokyo Bay Area, and even to areas which doesn't have a bay at all, which called New York Metropolitan Area. These are the three other areas that both inside and outside of China, they used to compare this Greater Bay Area with. Uh, as highlighted in this chart, you can tell that actually this Greater Bay Area is much more, uh, much larger in area and much bigger population compared to all the other three. And also in terms of infrastructure, they have built a lot more infrastructure, both in terms of international transport, air cargo, freight and container port throughput. Uh, easily 10 times or even 20 times more than what the other three areas like. But yet, the level of development of the, China, the Greater Bay Area in, Hong, in China is just about at best half of what the other uh, areas has achieved. The average uh, per capita GDP is about 24,000 uh, US dollars per year, compared with Tokyo's uh, 45. And, you know, 
just about one fifth of what the San Francisco Bay Area is like. So what can we draw from that is that there may be some people in China thinking that uh, this Bay Area in China, hopefully they can imitate uh, or copy what the other most developed regions around the world can achieve. Like Tokyo, which has been top in some of the advanced manufacturing, uh, New York, which are top in global finance, and San Francisco Bay Area is top in innovation and technology. In fact, this greater Bay Area in China has an element of uh, each of all those three characteristics. Uh, in the next slide, if you can um, go forward uh, one more, we see what is really unique, both within China as well as with, uh, outside of China about this greater Bay Area. Within China, you can easily see that this is one of the most open region. In fact, all those reforms or market-oriented reforms start from this region. Uh, you can see either from Hong Kong, Shenzhen, so some of the special economic zone and Guangdong province, which is still one of the highest <coughs> or most uh, uh, developed and uh, highest internationally connected provinces in China. And what is different is that this is the only place and only region where you have two cities called Hong Kong and Macau, which runs in a very different way in terms of the social political system and economic compared with the mainland, the one country, two systems. So these are the uniqueness of the Greater Bay Area compared even with those other Bay Area in China, uh, the Bohai Bay, the, the Hangzhou Bay Area, and those outside in New York, in Tokyo, as well as in uh, San Francisco. None of them have different systems running in parallel in the same region, which could be a disadvantage as well as an unique uniqueness for the region to go ahead. The next page actually shows you uh, details about the Greater Bay Area, which is composed of nine mainland cities and two SARs, special administrative regions. In fact, for most of us, you can probably only focus on four of them, Hong Kong and Macau, the two SAR, and Guangzhou and Shenzhen, which are the two mega cities. One is a provincial capital, the other one is a very special city in China. They themselves account for more than half of the total of this region in terms of the output. And they signify most of the key characteristics of the Greater Bay Area, both in terms of technology, uh, in terms of manufacturing, and in terms of finance and services. What is uh, interesting going forward, the next page is, <clears throat> um, within this region of about 50,000 square kilometers, uh, the first thing they need to overcome is the both uh, physical as well as man-made barriers because of one country, two systems in Hong Kong and Macau. There are border crossings, there are custom uh, crossings, there are different legal and commercial uh, regulations uh, compared with the mainland. And for people and for economic uh, activities to cut across these barriers, uh, sometimes this is uh, quite a puzzle for those who have traveled within the region uh, years ago, you, know, you understand. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure being built, uh, uh, being built and still underway. And within about 10 years of the last decade, you can see from this chart that they have managed to overcome uh, quite a bit from areas say, starting from the center of Hong Kong where you can travel within one or two or three hours. And what is planned probably is within another five to six years, you can basically reach uh, the whole Greater Bay Area easily within one hour for every part of this Greater Bay Area. So it's a lot of infrastructure building going on. For those who are in the infrastructure development, uh, there's no shortages of opportunities uh, in this region. That's the first thing. The second thing, next line, <clears throat> is a lot more complicated compared with uh, what just the basic uh, infrastructure is the softwares which cut across different regions and different cities, particularly between the two SARs and the uh, mainland part. Um, the central and local government has come together and come up with uh, quite a bit of different facilities. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. Basically, these are two perspectives. Most of those are some focusing on how to uh, provide more convenient 
for people living in Hong Kong and Macau to uh, work and live and travel uh, within the Greater Bay Area in the mainland side. Uh, for instance, they allow people to live there with a very uh, special status, not just as a visitor from Hong Kong, but you can basically enjoy uh, eco treatment or what we call as lateral treatment, like the local residents inside uh, mainland, if you prefer. Um, but more on the economic side, they also try to focus on, uh, focus on different aspects, like different professions, particularly in those in terms of uh, insurance and construction and legal area, they will allow them to have their professional qualifications in Hong Kong and Macau being recognized and to some extent practice the profession inside the mainland area, the Greater Bay Area. Um, we're expecting more and more of this de uh, development to come. Uh, in the medical side, we have already seen that not just for individuals, but institutions from Hong Kong and Macau who set up in the mainland area will be allowed to do something in the wilds of the other part of China to have the medical professions practiced, to have the medical uh, equipments uh, used before the mainland being authorized in other part of the region, uh, in other part of the country, and even have the drugs being used provided they were authorized in Hong Kong. So, we expect more of that to come, but these things will take time because uh, unlike other uh, development regions, these uh, are talking about cutting through different systems and different re, uh, SARs. Um, more and more, uh, the focus at, so at, the, at the moment is still how to make uh, people in Hong Kong and Macau, the two SARs, uh, work more conveniently and uh, uh, behave more uh, uh, similarly within the region uh, as the locals. For people outside of Hong Kong, outside of Macau, uh, particularly for friends from Singapore and other places, they will wonder what is that for me? Uh, there at least something which are uh, developing and we have been talking to the mainland officials and the uh, Hong Kong and Macau governments that uh, it is not just an area to integrate more the Hong Kong, Macau and mainland part, but also for this region, as I said, with the international perspective to make it a platform for Bell and Row and make it a, uh, an international uh, technology and innovation hub, you need to facilitate the lawn residents, particularly those lawn residents in not just in mainland, but lawn residents in Hong Kong and Macau to operate in this region. And those are coming through actually. In fact, uh, some of the latest development is that for lawn resident people who are, are working or uh, living in Hong Kong, they can uh, probably given a two to five years permit to work and travel around the Greater Bay Area, much easier than um, um, uh, those under different kind of uh, uh, visa uh, and operations. So we expect that to come. And also for people who with special tenants, not just from, uh, for those from Hong Kong, uh, when they work in the Greater Bay Area, in some selected area and selected uh, professions, they were allowed to have the same kind of personal income tax treatment, 15% uh, um, uh, threat uh, rate. Uh, enjoyed it in Hong Kong. So measures like that are coming through. So that tells us that actually what is the Greater Bay Area for is not just for, uh, for those in Hong Kong and Macau, but also for the rest of the world. Next page. So what are the trends and opportunities? There are different uh, areas. Uh, given what we have been uh, 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 told and what is being planned uh, first of all, this is one of the largest factory sites of China or even the world. So there's a lot of production activities. So those who are in this area of uh, business, either you use China as a production base or you want to supply to this production base, particularly in upgrading uh, the manufacturing and other production uh, activities, this is, a bay, uh, this is the area which you should focus on. The next area is about the population and market itself. Um, with 70 million population uh, and a GDP of about uh, per capita GDP of about 20 some uh, thousand US dollars, which is twice the average of China, uh, they have a GDP of 1.7 trillion US dollars per year for this whole Greater Bay Area. So it's a huge market by itself to develop. 
So those who are in the consumer market and selling into China, uh, either for the elderly, for the youngsters, or for the new middle class, there's uh, quite a bit of unlimited opportunities. And in fact, when we understand that this is a region where the, China, uh, uh, the central government tried to use as a pioneer, both uh, for their own development as well as for upgrading the living standard of the people, uh, people or companies who want to sell into China will can easily use that as a springboard and test the market and uh, penetrate the rest of the country. The third area of development for which have uh, bear, uh, significant business implication is uh, next. Uh, one, uh, yeah. uh, it's all more on the technology and innovation side. As I mentioned that this is the most open and most internationally connected and most market driven part of China. And from the Chinese point of view, for the economy to grow further, they can't just rely on the large number of population. Uh, in fact, the work, workforce has, been, uh, has started to shrink and getting older and older. What they need to do is to raise the quality of the labor as well as the quality of the input. Innovation and technology is uh, uh, critical for China at this stage. And Shenzhen has, uh, has uh, some of the largest uh, cluster of innovation and enterprises and technology companies. Uh, same as Hong Kong, which has uh, four to five universities which were ranked about the top 100 in the world with a lot of basic, uh, basic research uh, potential. And they are working together to leverage, um, build this region to be the innovation hub uh, for China at least and maybe for a wider region. So those who are in this area could have a lot more opportunities. Next one is about, of course, uh, green living, quality living, coming out of the virus uh, and the pandemic. Uh, this would be some of the area which will be leading in the, uh, the area of ESG and uh, smart city and those things. And lastly, one more piece, yep. Uh, that is a platform as uh, indicated in the development plan that China will use as a platform for its Bear and Road initiative. To put it simply, Bear and Road, well, our understanding from Hong Kong is that it's a Chinese way of globalization. China needs to connect more and better and deeper with the rest of the world. And the, probably the, uh, the most um, uh, typical area is its connection with uh, particular Southeast Asia, uh, where they know better, they have more connection, they, are, they have uh, a lot more complementarity in terms of the economic development and has been uh, a major or one of the largest trading partner anyway. So these are areas which we see uh, the GPA will have a lot more uh, opportunity to develop and to support. Next one. Uh, I can briefly go through an index we have built uh, for about one year now for business, uh, for companies uh, and people to understand more about the Greater Bay Area. We have a, a business confidence index, which has been, has started about a year ago and each uh, quarter it comes up higher and higher and um, the next page please. And within that index, we uh, cut it by different factor, different sectors. Manufacturing is leading. Uh, as you can see, uh, the export uh, energy in China is cranking. And retail and wholesale, given the virus being under, uh, uh, the pandemic being uh, more under control in China, uh, the domestic consumption has been getting more and more active. It's the links to the other activities. And followed by the others, like the innovation, finance, and professional services. Next one. And within this uh, region uh, or area, we cut it broadly into about six different uh, groups. Hong Kong, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, the three largest cities, Fosan and Dongguan, which are linked to Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Uh, all this shows that they have been recovering very strongly and both expect that the activities going forward is well above normal, which is 50. And Hong Kong finally in the last quarter when we do the survey has uh, coming back to normal as indicated in a 7.8% GDP growth in the first quarter. Next one. Lastly, it's just a little bit of propaganda uh, from the Trade Development Council, which uh, we were tasked to support business cross-border who are interested to use Hong Kong or go through Hong Kong. We have developed several things uh, other than the uh, confidence index uh, we publish every quarter. We have engaged uh, uh, several major studies on how different companies outside as well as inside the Greater Bay Area can use uh, this region and penetrate into this region. 
we also host um, uh, events inside the region, like the one we have in uh, Guangzhou, uh, to try to promote products uh, into China. And we have used about 19 outlets uh, we built within the Greater Bay Area to help companies to showcase and even sell the products into the region. So if you have anything interest about that, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, we have an office in Singapore who can easily uh, put you through to the necessary connections. And that's all I'm from, from me. And uh, sorry, I overrun a little bit and uh, I hand it back to Fora. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan, for sharing the latest development of the Greater Bay Area and the various opportunities arising from GBA with us, whether they are from the consumer market or from ICT, logistics, bear and road, etc. Um, yeah, we are pretty sure there were plenty of opportunities for Singapore and the regional uh, businesses. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. So now um, it comes to our Q&A session. Looks like our participants have already raised quite a number of interesting questions. Uh, perhaps um, first one, um, what are the outlook for oil and gas in China in short and middle terms? I guess this question is for Hui Ming. Hui Ming, would you like to share with us your thoughts? Please don't forget to unmute yourself. Hello. Now, um, looks like Hui Ming got some uh, technical issues. Um, perhaps we, we move on to another question first. Uh, why has China's economy been so resilient during the pandemic compared to other countries? Uh, looks like this question can be answered by all the three speakers. How about I invite Mr. Kwan to answer first and then followed by Edward? Is that all right? Yes, fine. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> the, I think there's few things uh, to handle the pandemic. It's not just the experience of China. You, know, you need two things. One is a good policy and then an effective implementation of that policy. In terms of policy response, we now understand that uh, those who fail to appreciate the, the seriousness of this pandemic are always lagging behind in the responses and that creates a lot of problems. China may be benefiting somewhat from the SARS experience before that they have some institution being built well before this crisis that uh, they have the national uh, 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 network to monitor uh, this kind of uh, uh, infectionary disease. Uh, they have push up the uh, testing as well as um, uh, uh, research uh, institutes in response to uh, this different kind of disease. So these are the key conditions for having the policy uh, that can be implemented. But uh, for the policy maker itself, it has to be uh, uh, quick and smart enough to recognize how serious the, uh, the issue would be. Uh, Experience probably helps a lot that uh, without understanding how infectious could have and how uh, deadly things could, could be, you can hardly imagine that uh, the kind of responses the Chinese officials uh, uh, respond to it. And in fact, you see this, uh, the, uh, the mistake made some, by some other governments uh, to some extent is probably because they don't have those previous experience. And of course, the, uh, the last thing is about <clears throat> Um, the way to implement, other than the infrastructure being built to monitor, to uh, circumvent, and to uh, to deal with the uh, the situation, uh, and you also need very strong cooperation between the government and the public. Uh, and uh, some people actually deal it through the political system, social network system, whatever. But uh, no matter what, I think from the uh, people's point of view. It is better to have someone who are more responsive and uh, better follow uh, what uh, the more reasonable and more rational uh, response like. So you need a lot of uh, convincing explanation and working through and the whole government civilian network being built have allowed for such uh, more effective responses 
So I can only attribute that to, uh, to and if you apply the two, same two factors to other countries where they can respond better or where they can uh, respond worse, uh, to a lot of extent is due to these two major factors. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kwan. Uh, how about Edward? Sure, thanks, Flora. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, just to add to uh, Mr. Kwan's very comprehensive response there, uh, aside from policy response, uh, which was uh, just mentioned by Mr. Kwan, uh, the only other item I'd add to that that we look at from a when we're looking from a currency perspective, uh, just is the domestic demand in China. Just the sheer size of China's domestic economy now has meant that uh, they're nowhere near as dependent on global trade that other countries are, such as here in Singapore, it's very dependent on global trade. Uh, my home country, Australia, much more dependent on global trade uh, than China. So the strength of the domestic economy and the emerging middle class uh, definitely has resulted uh, in uh, lockdowns and a, I guess a reduction in global trade just hasn't had the same negative impact on China as it might have five or 10 years ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I invite uh, Hui Ming to share your thoughts with us as well? Just looks like um, you have some issues with the camera, but um, can, can, you, can you speak uh, so that we, we see whether we can hear you? Hui Ming. Hello? Oh, looks like still the technical issues are still there. Um, how about, okay, perhaps we move on to the next question. Uh, I guess this question is for Edward. <laughs> I would like to hedge my UN buying requirements, but I have seen the rate come down a, a lot this year. Should I wait until it goes up uh, again? Um, yeah, for this one, may I invite um, our FX expert to share your views from the business perspective, please? Sure, thank you. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Flora. Uh, so uh, it's a very good question and, and it's for true that the uh, Yuan has strengthened significantly over the past six to 12 months that, for reasons we've uh, discussed earlier. Um, now we don't ever provide advice on if we think the current is going up or down. We're always a big believer in risk management. So doing nothing and waiting whilst we can't uh, stop uh, clients from doing that and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's important to be aware of the risk that, as we saw in the charts earlier, how much worse things can get. Uh, now, if you're a buyer of uh, Yuan, it is very easy to hedge uh, effectively given that interest rate differential. So a couple of options, if a buyer of Yuan isn't happy with the current rate, depending on how far out they need to hedge, they can achieve a better rate six months or 12 months out. Uh, alternatively, as we also discussed, they can put protection in place if they don't want things to get any worse, but still have a structure with participation in case rates do move higher. But hoping and waiting for a rate Sometimes it works and, and sometimes it could get worse. So it's important to be aware of just how far uh, things can actually move. Thanks, Flora. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one question on the GBA. Uh, Mr. Kwan, uh, may I know if there are any specific sectors which are restricted to foreigners or required a majority local share ownership? Um... Particularly for GBA, there's no. Uh, if there's any restriction, there's restriction all around China anyway. Um, so uh, I assume you mean either investment or business practices. Um, the, <clears throat> there are different levels of restrictions. Uh, in fact, for the whole uh, country as a whole, they have a negative, negative list for foreign investment as well as uh, practices, or particularly the service side. And then for some particular area like uh, the uh, free trade area or Highland free trade zone uh, dedicated recently, uh, they have also a list of uh, the same, but normally with less restrictions uh, in terms of the way they restrict or the sector they restrict. And uh, what I understand is that Greater Bay Area is normally the one which have some of the, not everything, but some of the least restrictions you can see in under those negative list, but um, you can easily check it uh, from the HKTTC website if needed, or from the Chinese government website, whatever uh, sector we related, 
or you can drop uh, drop me an email. We can check it for you if uh, you prefer so. Uh, but uh, those are different types of restrictions we are. But I don't. I haven't seen any GPA restrictions which are tighter than other part of China uh, in general. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, maybe uh, one last question, uh, since we are uh, overrunning a bit. Uh, also for Mr. Kwan, can you name a few platforms to sell products into China, especially those for children and uh, senior citizens? Oh, thanks. Uh, I have actually written to respond already, but I, so just for me to uh, repeat it. Um, the, um, Depends on what kind of platform you're looking for and which particular sector and area you are uh, you are interested in. But uh, HKTTC itself have actually some physical uh, as well as online platforms being built to facilitate that. Uh, the private sector itself have their own uh, built up like Alibaba and all those things. Uh, but we in Hong uh, in TTC we have uh, 19 shops uh, inside the Greater Bay Area where we can showcase as well as to sell. Uh, some of those pr products, uh, both including the elderly and the others, uh, mostly consumer products. And we also have a consigned EC arrangement, which means that for companies who doesn't want to have a presence, go through all the registration and uh, tax registration uh, formalities, uh, you can use our service to have your products sold as well as uh, uh, sewn and sold. Uh, and uh, most of the logistics in term, uh, custom clearance handled by our uh, uh, agents uh, for you. So uh, to put it simple, you can easily just ap uh, approach some of our office in Singapore as well as in uh, uh, whatever close to you uh, for details. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Uh, on this note, I would also like to thank uh, Hui Min and Edward for joining us and uh, sharing the insightful uh, presentations uh, and also be so engaging um, in the past one hour. Uh, we really appreciate the time and effort you've spent for our webinar this time around. Um, looks like we are overrunning the program a little bit. So perhaps we will have to end the session uh, this time for our fourth edition of the China Economic uh, Outlook uh, webinar. As we are coming to the end of the webinar, besides thanking the three speakers, on behalf of SBF, I would also like to thank all the attendees for joining us today and coming up with such a wonderful list of questions. We would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to join us as the SBF China and North Asia Business Group member, which is a complimentary service provided by SBF. Once you join this business group, you'll be able to receive future event invitations and updates on um, China and North Asian markets for us. And lastly, appreciate it if you can spend one to two minutes filling up the feedback form after the webinar. This will definitely help us improve our event management and the content development for the upcoming webinars. Once again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please stay, uh, stay safe, healthy, and uh, see you in our future events soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.